So, Assalamu Alaikum. Today is going to be our 12th lecture in the condensed matter physics course. We've started looking at electrons inside crystals, but so far we haven't probed the crystalline structure, the periodicity that is implied within the crystalline structure. We've just assumed that we have a sea of electrons, a Fermi sea of electrons that uh, roam about inside the volume of the solid and that the energies of these electrons, which are independent by the way, are quantized. And they lead to quantized levels, energy levels. Each level harbors two spin states. These states are filled up depending upon the number of electrons that are available. And at zero kelvins, an upper ceiling is re reached. And that ceiling is called the Fermi energy. So we looked at the zero Kelvin uh, scenario in, in our previous lecture. Today, we're going to relax this assumption and we're going to deal with higher temperatures. Uh, so, so let's get started and let me share my screen. <clears throat> Okay, here we are. So today is our 12th lecture. And today <clears throat> we are really going to look at the thermal properties of the quantized electron gas. And we ended our last lecture uh, on an equation that represented mode counting. And we argued that if we integrated with respect to energy, the density of states from zero to the upper limit, which we call the Fermi energy, we would get the number of electrons per unit volume. And this density of is defined as the number, the energy, uh, the number of states per unit energy, sorry. Dn over DE. And of course you need to divide by the volume as well, just for consistency. So if you count the number of states that are available from zero to the Fermi energy, we'll get the total number of states. Uh, so this is the scenario at zero Kelvins. Now most of condensed matter physics, most of solid state physics starts with a discussion on how the properties change with temperature. So whenever you make a new material and you're interested in a certain property of that material, for example, you're interested in looking at piezoelectric properties of the material, whether the material is ferromagnetic, whether it is ferroelectric, whether it's a good or a bad conductor, uh, is it a good dielectric? Does it have a high dielectric constant? So whenever you synthesize a new material or you start probing the material, the most obvious question one would ask is, how do the properties change with temperature? In other words, what are the thermal properties of uh, the material? What is the temperature dependence of the specific heat capacity, of the thermal conductivity, of the Peltier coefficient, of the Seebeck coefficient? So everything, most of condensed matter physics, as far as characterization and materials understanding is concerned, deals with the variation of properties with temperature. And that's what we're going to look at today. We have this quantized electron gas, uh, these quantized energy levels inside a, a crystalline solid, representing the free electrons, mostly uh, a valid situation for a metal. And then we would like to 
probe the temperature dependent properties of this sea of electrons. That's what we're going to do today. Now, in order to understand this, uh, we need to invoke another concept. And that is the concept of Fermi Dirac statistics. Now, you must have seen uh, this statistic in your statistical mechanics class. Uh, and if I were to plot this statistics, this is what I would get. I have energy on the horizontal axis and on the y-axis, I'm plotting the Fermi Dirac function, which of course is the function of energy, okay? So first of all, let me uh, draw this function at zero Kelvin. At zero Kelvin, this function is like a sharp edged step function. It's one from zero to a maximum value. And that maximum value is called mu, which stands for the chemical potential. And then the function is zero whenever the energy is greater than the chemical potential. The chemical potential has dimensions of energy, even though it's called potential, but it's really energy. So don't be misled by thinking that this is like a potential. It's, it's, it has dimensions of energy. Now, this is the Fermi Dirac statistics at zero Kelvins. And what the Fermi Dirac statistics tells us is the probability of occupancy of a state. And this sharp edged hat function that we've drawn blends in nicely with the discussion we had in the previous lecture. That is, you have energy levels spread out by a particular density of states. So if I plot E here and I plot the three dimensional density of states here, I get something that is varying as a square root of the energy. Now, mu lies somewhere. At zero Kelvins, the chemical potential is the same as the Fermi energy. So the Fermi energy is defined as the chemical potential at zero Kelvins. Okay. Now there's a certain Fermi energy, but the density of states is a function that can go up to infinity. However, if you look at the Fermi Dirac function here, only a non-zero probability of occupancy exists for states up till the energy EF. All right. And beyond that, no matter what the density of states is, there is zero probability of occupancy of those states. So really, if you would like to do state counting at arbitrary temperatures, not just zero Kelvins, you have to multiply out the density of states, which tell us the entire manifold of available states. And you have to multiply it with the probability of occupancy of each state of energy E. So if you would like to do mode counting at ordinary temperatures, so what you would like to then do is you would like to integrate with respect to energy and take into account not just the density of states, but also the probability of occupancy of each state. And this uh, integral can go from zero to infinity. Okay. And the integral will be equal to the number of electrons per unit volume or the number density of electrons. So at zero Kelvins, uh, this Fe was simply equal to one up till the Fermi energy, all right? But in general, this Fermi Dirac, if you were at higher temperatures, you would have to use the proper form of the Fermi Dirac statistics, which is not really a step function, rather it is modified. So in order to, <clears throat> first of all, let's plot what the Fermi Dirac function looks like at 
higher temperatures. So I have Fe which is just probability, it cannot go bigger than 1. This is the chemical potential. This is the curve for 0 Kelvin. The probability, it's like a probability density function. And now if I were to raise the temperature by some Kelvins, this is what I would get. This sharp edge will smooth out a little bit. And there will be a tail that extends beyond the Fermi energy. Okay. So, this is at some temperature T1 higher than 0 Kelvin. If I were to further increase the temperature, the curve always passes through this point, this symmetric point, which is at a height of one half. It's at 50 percent probability and the tail extends further and the deviation from the sharp edges happens a bit earlier. Okay, so this is what the Fermi Dirac statistics look like at higher temperatures and there has to be a formula for this Fermi Dirac function. And if I were to write the formula for this Fermi Dirac function, you would like to put an FD if you want with it. I think you've derived this already in the statistical mechanics course. This is equal to 1 over E raised to the power E minus mu over KBT plus 1. And you, you will observe that if your energy equals mu, then this probability density function turns out to be one half. If your energy is larger than mu, then this term is an exponent. It gives you a large number and one over a large number is something small. And since it's an exponent, it explodes rapidly whenever E goes beyond mu. So the tail does not extend very far beyond mu. This region here, this region here, does not go very far off. It quickly asymptotes down to zero because of this exponential factor. So you really, really need to have a very high temperature if you would like to see pronounced deviations from the square edged function. And you can use the same argument to the left of this chemical potential as well. Okay. So if E is less than mu, then whatever I've written in yellow is e raised to power a number smaller than 1. Okay. And this will give me a number that is larger than 1. It's in the denominator, I get a probability density function that is smaller than 1. And you can use MATLAB or Mathematica to look, to tune your, tune your variable, the, your temperatures a little bit and see how this function changes. Okay. So this, on the left, I've uh, written down the formula for the graph, the probability density function that I've drawn on the right. So in order to do mode counting, and if I were to count the number of states that are populated, not just available, the states that are populated by electrons, I would have to multiply the density of states with the Fermi Dirac function, and then I integrate. Okay, any questions? Now let's look at some applications of this concept. Now the first application that I would like to, so if you look at the integral here, <clears throat> excuse me, looking at this integral, there's a common recurring theme. There's a density of states, a DOS and is being multiplied by the Fermi Dirac function. Fermi Dirac function. So the Fermi Dirac function is multiplying some function to give you an integral. Okay. If, for example, <clears throat> I wanted to calculate the total energy of the system, so you have a quantized electron gas and I'm interested in finding the internal energy of this electron C, I would 
simply take the probability of occupancy of uh, a particular state, multiply it with the density of states. And what I need to find is the average energy. So I multiply this with E and then I integrate with respect to E from zero to infinity. This will give me the internal energy per unit volume of, of the solid. So now I have the same theme. I have the Fermi Dirac function multiplied with some other function. Okay. And all of this is making sense because F is a probability density function. If I would like to find the average of something, I multiply that something with the probability of population of that something and integrate over all the somethings. That's what finding out the average or the expectation value of something really means. So this is a general theme of uh, in this subject. So we need to have a mechanism of finding out the, these integrals. And thanks to Sommerfeld, who's a very accomplished scientist, though relatively lesser known, thanks to the Sommerfeld expansion, we can come up with a methodical process of calculating these integrals. So I would like to derive the Summerfield expansion and then I like to exemplify it through three means. I would like to find out how does the chemical potential change with temperature. And I think uh, Heather had this question about the temperature dependence on of the Fermi energy. The Fermi energy is the chemical potential at zero kelvins, but the chemical potential itself can depend upon temperature and we'll see how. The second question is how do we find out the total internal energy of the system? And the third question, I would like to pick up an example from magnetism. Okay, so what is the Summerfield expansion? The Summerfield expansion talks about an integral, a general integral I, which is integrated over energy. Uh, I modulate the something with the probability density function. And then I assume that I'm talking about some other function whose average I'm interested in calculating. And that function is, suppose, has a general form D gamma over DE. And gamma is a function of energy. Okay, so I start off with this general form and I have the assumption that this arbitrary unknown function or a function of interest gamma at E equals zero is zero. And I would like to find out what this integral means. Then whatever, I then look at particular examples and I equate that something with this derivative of gamma uh, and find out the results from the sum of expansion to compute my values of interest. And that's what I'm going to exemplify right now. So let's call this number one. Okay. Now, how do I solve this integral? I have two limits of integration from zero to infinity. I could simply do an integration by parts. So I take F, which is a function of E, and I'm not writing the E again. I take the integral of D lambda over DE, and this gives me lambda, and my limits of integration are from zero to infinity, minus zero to infinity, <clears throat> and then what I need to do is I would simply uh, what next uh, I would do this integral again and the derivative of f correct so I'm writing the derivative by this prime sign so this is the integration by parts that I need to do now let's look at the first term on the left hand side. This first term is zero because f at infinity is zero and lambda at zero is zero as we've defined already. So the first term on the left is zero and I'm left with finding out the need to find out this integral.
Okay. Now remember that this lambda is a function of energy. And of course, this F prime is also a function of energy. Okay. So now let's look at this lambda. And I would like to write down this lambda, which is a function of energy about the point mu, about the chemical potential. And I would like to do a Taylor expansion of this, of this variable about mu. So in, if I were to do this Taylor expansion, this lambda at energy E will become lambda at my pivot point mu plus how far away is the energy from mu multiplied by the derivative of lambda computed at mu plus one half the double derivative of lambda computed at mu multiplied by e minus mu whole square and so on. So, so this is my Taylor series expansion for lambda. Now I would just like to put in this Taylor series expansion in to my original formula. I becomes <coughs> F prime E minus zero to infinity D E lambda prime computed at mu e minus mu minus half 0 to infinity excuse me okay can you see my screen no sir no sir Mm. Minus half zero to infinity d e and so on. So this is my integral of interest. Now, of course, this term here is a constant, this term is a constant, this term is a constant, and these terms can be taken outside the integral. So if I look at the first term, and I just look at the integral from zero to infinity d e f prime e, so I'm taking the integral of a derivative, and this will just be the function itself. So this will be f of infinity minus f of 0. Now f of infinity is 0 and f of 0 is 1, no matter what the temperature is. So I will get minus 1. So the first term is taken care of already. Okay, this, the first term equals minus the function lambda at mu. Now let's look at the second term. Now, if I were to consider uh, the second term, by the way, by the way, I've, sorry, there is an F prime always with each term. I've just forgot to write the F prime here. Now let's look at the second integral. Uh, I need to find out 0 to infinity dE e minus mu f prime. Okay. I've already defined, I know what my f is going to be. My f is the Fermi Dirac function 1 over e, e minus mu over kBT plus 1. So, Suppose I change my variable, e minus mu I write is x, and 1 over kBT I write as beta. So my f is 1 over e raised power beta x plus 1. So I need to find out f prime. My f prime is going to be minus 
1 over e beta x plus 1 whole square beta e raise to beta x. Okay, this is my f prime. And this will eventually become e beta. I can take this inside the bracket. This will become. Okay. And this I think becomes minus 4 beta cosine hyperbolic square beta x. Okay. And remember that this is an even function of x. So if I were to plot this f prime versus x, I would get something of this kind. So f prime is an even function of x. E minus mu, which is simply x, is an odd function of x. Okay. And I'm integrating from 0 to infinity. So my domain apparently is only in positive ease. By the way, if since mu is a constant, I can always replace dE by dE minus x. It doesn't matter. Uh, sorry, dE minus mu, which is dx. So the integral here really becomes dx 0 to infinity x to the minus 4 beta cosine square beta x. This is even and this is odd. Now, uh, we should also remember that f is the derivative of the Dirac delta function. And the derivative of this Dirac delta function, I'm going to look at the plot of the Dirac delta function, is non-zero only in the vicinity of the chemical potential. Okay? If it were at zero Kelvin, it would be a sharp Dirac delta function at, at the Fermi energy. Otherwise, f is almost constant everywhere. So its derivative is going to be zero everywhere. And if I were to hypothetically extend this energy variable back to negative values, I, I would mathematically my f prime, if, if I force it to be zero everywhere, which it really is, I can extend the domain back to negative values of x as well. So I can replace the lower limit of integration in this integral, I can replace zero by minus infinity because f prime here is zero anyway. So if I were to do that, I will get minus infinity to plus infinity x, x into some even function, which I've written over here. Now an odd function is being multiplied with an even function and it's being integrated over all of x, this will give me identically zero. So the second integral in this summer field expansion, this integral turns out to be zero. Okay, did I hope, I hope you got this point. Now, if I look at the third integral, so let me write down the third integral. <coughs> the third <coughs> term, this is minus half <clears throat> zero to infinity d e e minus mu squared and f prime e which is a function of e Now, the, here, this is a standard integral. This integral, you can look up in any standard reference book, or you could do this integration in Wolfram's integrator. All of this has a standard value. And that standard value is pi square over 6 kb square the double derivative, this thing here, the double derivative of gamma with respect to energy 
compute it at energy equals to mu. So now I have the first three terms in my summer field expansion. And I, for the time being, I'm truncating my series to only three terms. My I overall, I, I'm just now going to summarize the results. My I overall, which is an integral of the Fermi Dirac function multiplied by some derivative of some function. And you integrate from zero to infinity. This is going to give me the value of the function at the chemical potential plus pi square over six kbt whole square the double derivative of the function also computed at me and higher order terms which i am neglecting because i am expecting them to be really small so this is the summer field expansion now we're going to use this summer field expansion to compute parameters of interest. How do different properties vary with, uh, with energy? So any questions up to this point? What I've done is only derived the summer field expansion and I've shown you all steps as we went along, step by step, step by step. Any questions? I can give you half a minute break here. Sir, can you kindly provide the intuitive definition of the chemical potential? The chemical potential? Yeah, I'll, I'll yes, do sir. that. I'll do that, Heather. All right. Just give me some time because I'm going to show the temperature dependence of this. So chemical potential is, the intuitive sense of chemical potential is if you have some system, and you would like to add system of particles, you'd like to add another particle to it. How much energy would it require? Okay. If you would like to remove a particle from an ensemble of particles, how much energy would that require? This is the intuitive physical uh, explanation of, of the chemical potential. Just imagine the concept of electric potential. If you have a charged body, like a plate, which has already charge on it, positive charge, say five coulombs on it. You would like to add another charge on it. It will cost you energy because you're bringing a positively charged particle onto an already charged plate. This is going to cost energy, okay? So because the potential is high, if you have relatively fewer initial charge on the plate, it's going to be relatively easier to add another charge. So the potential of that charged object defines how difficult it is to participate in charge exchange processes. Likewise, the chemical potential is, you have a, a, an ensemble of particles. The chemical potential is a quantitative measure of how difficult or easy it is to exchange particles with the surroundings. So that's one intuitive definition. Another intuitive definition is that this represents the average energy of, of the particles in the system under certain conditions. Okay. Okay, Heather. Now, why does this uh, intuitive, uh, picture make sense? Uh, for that, we need uh, another course on statistical mechanics. But uh, as when I describe semiconductors and how charges flow inside semiconductors and N and a P type material have a certain chemical potential. And why do charges flow from one medium to another? Then the idea of this chemical potential can be brought to life, okay? But I've described a, a physical intuitive picture of the chemical potential as the relative ease or difficulty by which particles can be exchanged with the environment. Okay? Now, let's look at a few examples. The first example 
I would like to choose is how does the chemical potential change with the temperature itself? Okay. So we know that the chemical potential at zero kelvins is equal to the Fermi energy. By the way, many authors uh, naively, they just uh, make the terms chemical potential and the Fermi energy synonymous with one another. But they're really different. From a Puritan's perspective, they are different quantities. The chemical potential at zero kelvins must be called the Fermi energy. Okay, but we'll, we'll see right now that the deviation from the Fermi energy is really small, even if you go to very large temperatures. So that's what we're going to show right now. So we know that at arbitrary temperatures, <clears throat> at arbitrary temperatures, uh, if you were to do more counting, then we could take the integral of energy from zero to infinity. We have the Fermi Dirac function and we multiply this with the density of states. This will give us n. Okay, there's really no doubt about this. Now, if you look at the this equation that I've written here and look at this integral and look at the correspondence of the integral with, with what I've written here. The two integrals will correspond if this g here equals d lambda over de. So I can find out what lambda is. So if you look at equation number two, I need to find out what lambda is at a certain energy and put that energy equal to the chemical potential. Okay, so my g in this integral equals d lambda by de which means that my lambda really equals the integral of g and since from so if i put a prime here so my variable of integration is e prime and this must go from 0 to e if i want to put an e here but if i want to put a mu here which i really want because look at the first term here i want to find out the gamma at at the chemical potential. So this would become zero to mu. And then I can just put G E D E. Okay. So this is my first term. Okay. In the expansion. All right. Now the second term is going to be. So my N is equal to this first term zero to mu G D E. And my second term, of course, is going to be pi square over 6 kBt whole square. And now I need the double derivative of, of lambda. But the first derivative of lambda is g. So the double derivative of lambda is going to be the derivative of g itself computed at mu. Okay, so far so good. Now if you <clears throat> would like to uh, do some algebra here, let's do some algebra here. So if I look at this equation here, let's call it number three. I know that my G E equals some C square root of the energy. And my G prime, therefore, can be easily calculated. It's half C E minus half. And I can insert these values in here. Uh, right, like this. So, but before I, okay, good. So far, so good. So my N equals, so if I were to integrate this G, this will become C E raised to the power 3 by 2, 2 by 3. Okay, at mu plus pi square by 6 kb t square. My derivative of G is 
वन हाफ सी ई एट म्यू सो माई एन इक्वल टू बाई थ्री सी म्यू रेस पा थ्री बाई टू प्लस पाई बाई सिक्स के बी टी स्क्वेर वन हाफ सी म्यू ई माइनस ओके दिस इज माई एन लेट्स कॉल दिस क्वेर नंबर थ्री Okay, so some I want to get rid of these C's. So I do also know for a fact that my N will not change with temperature. Increasing or decreasing the temperature does not change the number of density. Uh, at least that's my assumption. I'm assuming that everything is happening at constant volume. So if that were true, my N I already know <coughs> is if I were at zero Kelvin. I would use a formula of this kind: d p g e from zero to e f must equal n. So this means that my c d e e this power one by two from zero to e f must equal n. This means that my <coughs> uh, c e three by two two by three at e f. Excuse me. Okay, I just I think I would need to change the batteries again. Can you just give me? Oh no, my screen has stuck. So I just need to restart my my things over here. So just give me a second, please. <coughs> <clears throat> Let me share my screen. Okay. Challenge, ji. Bismillah. So, this is my n. This n turns out to be C E F three by two, two by three. All right. So I can replace. This n on the right hand side, on the left hand side, sorry, I will get two over three c e f base by three by two is two over three c mu three by two plus <clears throat> pi square over six k b t whole square half c mu minus one half. I can get rid of the c's. In fact, two over three C's. I can just get rid of them on both sides. I need to multiply by three over two here as well. Get rid of the C, and I'm left with <clears throat> one equals mu over E F three by two plus. One over eight k b t whole square i square one o one over mu. All right. Now, if I were to <clears throat> manipulate this slightly and use the binomial expansion. so what i would get is mu over ef and this you could do on your own 3 by 2 1 plus pi square over 8 kbt whole square mu square because i have just taken out mu this by 3 by 2 equals 1 and this would become mu over f Become one plus pi square over eight k b t whole square mu square. I need to multiply both sides, so this will become minus two by three. Now the last thing that I could do is mu equals e f one sir plus two by three. नहीं होगा. नहीं वो दूसरी तरफ ले गया हूँ ना मैं इसको. 
So now what I could do, I could use binomial expansion here, here, okay, this binomial expansion, because mu square, uh, the chemical potential is, has a Fermi temperature, Tf, much, much, much larger of the order of 10,000 Kelvins, which is much larger than all ordinary temperature. So this term over here is less than one, I can use the binomial expansion. And if I were to do that, I would get one minus pi square over 12. I could replace my mu by KBTF and my final result will look like this. Okay. Where I have uh, done the following step uh, on the right hand side, I've replaced KBT over mu by T over KBT over, I've, I've replaced this mu on the right hand side by EF because it's a square. I can do this replacement because uh, the square gives me a much, much smaller number. And if my deviation of mu from EF is really small, and if all of this is in a square, I can replace my mu by EF because EF is so close to mu. I can't do that replacement over here. Okay, so since I have a square head, I can make a replacement on the right hand side. Eventually, I end up with this thing over here. Now, since E is much smaller than TF, this is of the order of 10 for 4 Kelvins. Uh, uh, iron, for example, melts around 2000 degrees centigrade, suppose. Tungsten around, say, 3,000 degrees centigrade. This is 10,000 Kelvins. So all ordinary temperatures that we are accustomed to dealing with on the planet Earth have Fermi temperatures much, much smaller, have temperatures much, much smaller than the Fermi temperature. So by looking at all of this, uh, this is really telling us that if I were to increase the temperature, <clears throat> my mu is hardly going to change from, from EF. Only at very large temperatures, really large temperatures, do I see any minuscule deviation of order of 0.01% perhaps. Okay, so the dependence of the chemical potential on the temperature is real, but it's negligibly small. Okay, now the second example I would like to give you is computing the total energy, of course, per unit volume, the internal energy of the system. Now, can anyone take this bold leap of faith and write on the board or tell me or dictate what should I write for the integral? How should I place the different, uh, the Fermi statistics and the different variables inside the integral? So let me set it up for you. So I have DE, zero to infinity. What should I write here if I wanted to find out the total internal energy of the system? What am I integrating? <clears throat> the density of state G of P. Density of state T. And uh, for me to write co coefficient. So this is the uh, so density of states E, G, and F. E. That's it. I need the energy. I'm not counting the number of states. Multiply by the energy. E. Multiplied by the energy. So this factor now has to be equal to my d lambda over dE if I were to use the summer field expansion. Okay. Now, <clears throat> so, so this really means that my lambda is the integral of eg with respect to e from zero to mu from zero to, if i were to compute this at mu this is what i need to need to calculate now i know that this is equal to t e prime half i can multiply this with e prime and i can do all of this calculation and uh, then I could also find the derivative of this thing here because I need the double derivative of lambda 
this will be the derivative of e g e this will become g plus e g prime e so i can repeat whatever i've done earlier do all the algebra correctly and use by the way this important formula which i think you've already seen in statistical mechanics use this important formula uh, in in passing and you can derive the total energy of the system by the way let me ask you a question what is the energy of the system at zero kelvins what kind of integral do i need to set up de what should be the limits of integration and what should be the variable over here at zero kelvins ab bata sakte hain mujhe please this is zero se fermi energy tak chali jayi hai limits bilkul aur yahan pe सर एफ ई की जगह वन आ जाएगा और ई e की ई e और जी ठीक है ना तो दिस विल बिकम डी ई सी बाय द वे रिमेंबर आई एम डीलिंग विद थ्री डायमेंशन हेयर इन टू डायमेंशन द एक्सपोनेंट्स द इंडिसीज विल चेंज right so this is u not and i can express this final answer u in terms of u not and let me share the final result with you this is a do it yourself homework problem and from once i have the energy i can find out the heat capacities i can find out the free energy i can find out the gibbs energy and so on i can find out all the parameters of interest once i have the free energy available with me i can find out the entropy as well of the system and i'm sure you've learned about this in your statistical mechanics class have you or have you not can you can anyone give me a heads up ये चीजें पहले देखी ठीक है ऑल राइट नो थर्ड एग्जांपल आई वुड लाइक टू गिव बाय द वे द हीट कैपेसिटी अकॉर्डिंग टू दिस फॉर्मूला टर्न्स आउट टू बी प्रोपोर्शनल टू टेंपरेचर ओके बट इफ यू हैव अ सॉलिड it's not just the electrons that exist in the solid it's the ions as well and those ions can also be modeled as quantized harmonic oscillators and we're going to model those as well so they're not just quantized electrons in the system they are quantized vibrations of the structure of atomic cores as well and those quantized oscillations they also can be labeled as particles just like electrons and those particles are called phonons so what we've done right now is the heat capacity due to the free electrons only but there's a heat capacity due to the phonons as well and the overall heat capacity which is which tells us how much energy is needed to be input into the solid so that its temperature could be raised how much does the energy change by the increase of temperature in other words will be a combination of the heat capacity from the electrons and the heat capacity from the phonons so so you really need to if you were to do an experiment on a solid you would really need to find out the heat capacity from the phonons as well and the overall contributions give you the overall heat capacity and if you were to look at the debye model of the heat capacity for for uh, uh, quantized harmonic oscillators pv would depend upon the third power of the temperature if you're not very very far off from zero kelvins so cv is really equal to some a plus bt cube where a and b are some constants 
So this is coming from the electrons, the first term. And the second term is coming from the phonons. And if we were to plot the table CV over T, this will be A. Sorry, but my n has gone a plus b t squared. And if I were to make a graph of c v t versus t squared, I would get a straight line. <clears throat> this intercept would be a, and this slope would be b. <coughs> All right, so third example that I would like to give, that comes from magnetism. So I like to talk about magnetic susceptibility of this sea of electrons. Ye bhi statistical mechanics mein kiya aapne pehle? Uh, no, sir. For example, if I have energy on this graph, on this axis, and I put GE here, GE, as you all know, is the density of states. Okay. And there is, and it takes into account both spins. Electrons really have spins. Okay. So there's a spin up and there's a spin down. And they're differentiated by the spin quantum number, ms half and ms minus half. Okay, so if I were to look at these electrons, you know that each electron is identified by three quantum numbers, nx, ny, and nz. So I can put all of this in a in a cat. It's a quantum state. Okay, uh, and nx, ny, and nz, we all know they are integers. These are these are quantized k levels. And those K levels are defined by these three characteristic quantum numbers, NX, NY, and NZ. So these are the spatial quantum numbers. But in addition to these spatial quantum numbers, we know that each level is doubly occupied. One by a spin plus half and the other by a spin minus half. So really the entire quantum state has to be a tensor product or a combination of the spatial degrees of freedom or the orbital degrees of freedom and the spin degrees of freedom. So ms, which could be plus half or minus half. So this is the overall quantum mechanical wave function for the electron, the free electron, independent electron. OK. Now, if it were to take into account spin, we've already know that the uh, energy density is proportional to the 1 half power of e. But in this diagram, so that square root relationship can be represented in this fashion. But now I'm going to draw this diagram in which I'm going to draw the spin up electrons distinctly from the spin down electrons. So I use the right hand of this diagram to denote spin spins of one kind and the left to denote spins of the other kind. Okay, so this is just a notational drawing. Uh, this kind of drawing is called a spin split <coughs> drawing or spin, <coughs> excuse me, bands. So there's a spin up band. This, let's call this the spin up band. This is the spin down band. All right. <coughs> now, suppose I'm at uh, zero Kelvin. So this level here is my mu which must equal EF. And if this were the case, these levels are occupied by spin up electron. And these levels are occupied by the spin down electrons. So the number of spin down electrons is equal to the number of spin up electrons. And if this material were to be magnetic, in other words, paramagnetic, I need to have 
spin up electrons that are uncancelled by spin down electron but since the population density of both of these kinds of spins is the same this material is not going to show any magnetization whatsoever okay however the zeeman effect someone mentioned the zeeman effect the other day what the zeeman effect does is that it lifts the degeneracy between the spin up and the spin down levels so one level goes slightly up and the other level goes slightly down so the energy in the presence of a magnetic field is ms strength of the field into some constant which is called the bohr magneton which as far as i remember is something of this kind m is now the mass of the electron and ms could be plus half it could be minus half so this is the zeeman effect by the way now if i were to apply a magnetic field here in this diagram say the electrons which have spins parallel to the magnetic field they will lower their energies and the electrons that are anti parallel to the field will higher their energy and that is obvious from from this equation as well so this these degenerate spin split bands will mutually shift with respect to one another one of the bands is going to go down and the other band is going to go up okay and the shift is going to be equal to b mu b because one is going down by half units the other is going up by another half units so so if i were to redraw this diagram now in the presence of a magnetic field one spin band goes down this was the previous position it goes down by minus half b mu b and the other spin band spin band goes up by plus half mu b all right so now what's going to happen is the following there is a relative mismatch or a polarization difference or there's a state of inequilibrium in which the number of spin up electrons and the spin down electrons can even though right now it's the same but the spin down electrons the green electrons don't take literally the spin down electrons have go gone higher in energy and now there are vacant levels available at the same energy in the spin up band this is the spin up band spin down band now you have electrons which are spin down and they are at a higher energy than what is allowed by equilibrium and nearby levels are already available which are vacant so what's going to happen is that these electrons are going to jump from their filled state <clears throat> to the empty state and they're going to flip their spins in the process eventually what's going to happen a new state of equilibrium will be achieved and in that if i were to draw this new state of equilibrium this is what it's going to look like so these are my spin down electrons anti parallel to the magnetic field and these are my spin up electrons parallel to the field there are more spin up electrons now than there would be otherwise so this would result in this sample acquiring a magnetization and i can derive what this magnetization is going to be and how do i do that i simply 
need to find out m which is my magnetization per unit volume the magnetization of a single spin is mu b i need to have an integral de with respect to e now i just need to count the number of so what i really need is the number of spins up minus the number of spins down and i multiply this with mu b now mu b is out of the integral n plus is de the density of states now my energy has changed the density of states uh spin up the energy has gone down by mu b b over 2 Fe minus de g e plus mu b b to Fe. Okay. Now, if I were to use the Taylor series expansion for this, uh, the density of states. I, I could simply rewrite this as mu b, the amount of change. By the way, there's a half factor of half here because there are half spins as compared to the original in one band versus the other. So if I were to do the Taylor series expansion, this difference in the two g's, this difference in the two g's is going to be simply given by the uh, derivative of g with respect to e and I multiply this with uh, there's a b here as well mu b b is is the spin uh, is the magnetization of a single electron so if i were to do all of this and I would do all my calculations uh, properly. This I will also give as a homework. My final result would be equal to, excuse me, my M is going to turn out to be three over two N mu B square. And I will have an this for minus one, three over two N mu b square p e f and if i were to replace this b with a mu naught h h is an applied field i can find out the susceptibility which is m over h which is going to be given by 3 over 2 n mu naught permeability for phi space b square over e f which is can also be written as t f so the susceptibility is as you can see independent of of the temperature and there is some susceptibility the, the application of a magnetic field creates a polarization difference which is created by a difference in the density of states because the density of states has, has now shifted one density of states band has gone down the other has gone up the up electrons see vacant levels in the nearby uh, spin uh, band and they make that transition while flipping their spins leaving more electrons in spin states of one kind over the other and that polarization difference gives the sample of electrons a magnetization and if i were to find out the if you wanted to find out the susceptibility i would divide that magnetization by the applied field h i will get the paramagnetic susceptibility this is called paramagnetism because now we have these unpaired electrons the spin up electrons a certain fraction of them are unpaired they do not have spin down electrons to cancel them out and this gives rise to a paramagnetic susceptibility but the electrons also have some uh, have some other properties the atomic cores also contain electrons and all of them are paired up they will also give rise to certain kinds of magnet magnetization and that is diamagnetism. 
so i'm not going to cover that because that's uh, reserved for a course on magnetism so these are the three examples of different properties of the of the quantized free electrons that emerged that emerged from the uh, quantization description uh, we started in the previous lecture so i'll be happy to answer some questions and please uh, do your homework number 4 it's due on friday so koi sawal puchna hai aapne nahi sir clear hi hai sorry so in the next lecture i'm going to uh, discuss a very important topic and uh, so far we assumed that the spatial motion of electrons is not deterred deterred or perturbed or disturbed by magnetic fields only that the energies are changing change so that you have to find out the density of states as the changed energies which can go up or down but in fact the orbital motion and the spatial motion of electrons can also be uh, disturbed and that's what the hallmark of the hall effect is so i'm going to look at the hall effect and then i'm going to see that this disturbance of the spatial motion of electrons also imposes another kind of quantization and that quantization is called the landau quantization uh, so i'm going to talk about landau landau quantization and this is a really important concept as far as modern condensed matter physics is concerned because it's the starting point for a discussion of the electronic properties of graphene and the entire family of graphene like materials so next lecture is going to be our last lecture on quantized electrons but it's going to deal with landau quantization and landau magnetization so please try to attend these uh, lectures even though they are recorded and uploaded but still i think it's important that you participate inside the class uh, sir aap ye jo lecture notes hain kindly ye hamare sath share kar sakte hain kyunki jab hum dobara se recording dekh rahe hote hain to if we have the notes in another window open usko saath hum dekh sake review kar sake to it's helpful to bilal aap waise notes lete nahi ho khud sir notes jo main deta hu to i just note the main points kyunki pehle main book se follow kar leta tha i took the lecture then i read the book so it made it a lot clear to notes jo mere apne hote hain to that's like an outline of the chapter jo hum cover kar rahe hote hain chale main share kar dunga aapke sath bilkul kar dunga all right sir thank you चैलेंज शुक्रिया शुक्रिया जनाब एंड खुदाफिज